One of the stereotypes of minorities is that they like to speak up about experiencing discrimination. The stereotype is that minorities who attribute failures due to discrimination are less likeable than those who take it on the chin. People seem to understand the negative consequences of claiming discrimination. For example, women are more likely to cry discrimination when on their own or with other women than when they're with men. However, the stereotype that minorities like to cry discrimination is actually wrong. Research has been done that deliberately exposes minorities to racism and sexism in the lab in order to study this issue. In these studies, researchers asked people to explain why they thought they failed a test or why they thought they failed an interview. Even when people are exposed to circumstantial evidence suggesting that they are a victim of prejudice, people are usually reluctant to say so. People often stay quiet in the face of discrimination and are not likely to make the assumption that they're being discriminated against. In the case of sexism, when women are asked what they would do if they came across an example of sexism, they massively overestimate their willingness to confront the sexism head on. In 1999, Swim and Hires got a group of female participants to take part in small group discussions. The participants were instructed to select 12 people whom they thought would be able to survive on a desert island from a list of 30 people created by the researchers. On this list were 15 women and 15 men with different occupations. The group members then took turns in highlighting their thoughts and reasons for their suggestion. Some groups were made up of only one female participant while the remaining group members were male confederates. The other groups were made up of two female participants and a male confederate. Unbeknownst to the participants, there were a number of male confederates in each group who were instructed to provide sexist comments during the group discussions. For example, when someone suggested to select an athlete or a trainer, a male confederate said, yeah, we definitely need to keep the women in shape. When another person suggested to select a chef, a confederate said, no, one of the women can cook. When someone suggested to select a female musician, a confederate said, I think we need more women on the island to keep the men satisfied, to keep everyone happy. So how did people respond to these outrageous comments? Well, as you can see here, a lot of people simply ignored the comments or waited to see what others would do. These were the same response in this study as the researchers couldn't tell which was which. There were far fewer confrontational responses. The top confrontational responses were to question the comment, focus on the task, or on the inappropriateness of the remark, use sarcasm, or express surprise. In a second study, female participants were given scenarios that described the situation participants experienced in the sexist group discussion from the previous study. They were instructed to imagine that they were participating in the same group discussion and were asked to rate the extent that they thought the comments made by the male group members were sexist or inoffensive. In the end, participants were asked to indicate the extent to which they would give various different responses to the sexist remarks from the group discussion. These responses included ignoring the comment, wait to see what others would do, question the response, a task-related response, comment on inappropriateness, sarcasm or humour, surprise exclamation, grumbling and hit or punch. So let's see how people's anticipations about how they would respond match up with how people actually respond. Swim and hires found that hardly anyone said they would ignore the comment or wait to see what others do. In fact, only 1% of people said they would ignore the sexist comment and only 4% of people indicated that they would wait to see what others do. Close to 50% of people said they would comment on the inappropriateness of the sexist comment. And 40% of people said they would cut the person who was making the sexist comment down with sarcasm or humour, for example, making an anti-male sexist comment. 40% of people said they would show surprise to the sexist comment, and 8% of people said they would hit or punch the person making the sexist comment. As you can see, when we compare the results from both studies, the data showing what participants actually did in the group discussion tells a different story. Swim and Hires found that when participants took part in the group discussions, nobody hit or punched the person who made the sexist comments. Only 16% of people showed surprise, sarcasm or humour, and comment on the inappropriateness of the sexist comment. And a whopping 55% of people actually ignored the comment and waited to see what others would do. 
This is very typical because the first response people have to what they suspect is sexism, racism or any other form of discrimination is not outrage. Self-doubt is sometimes the first response where people are like, whoa, did I just hear right? Sometimes people kind of look around and are like, was that person joking? They're kind of doing this hypothesis testing on whether the comments they've heard are real or not. People don't want to come across as taking comments seriously, misinterpreting it, getting angry about it, and then finding out the other person was just joking. So most people keep it to themselves. Afterwards, they might go to their friends, talk to them about the remark, and even get their opinion on it. Eventually, they might conclude that the comment was pretty sexist and then become outraged. But by then, it's a little bit late to confront it. So the idea that people will confront sexism or racism head on, maybe by responding, how dare you, and storming off, just rarely happens.